بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله we're starting tonight our first lecture and a lecture series entitled a sitting with the Sahaba and this lecture series inshallah ta'ala is going to be continuous when I am in Doha, inshallah ta'ala. I mean, not every week, but the weeks that I'm here in Doha, inshallah ta'ala, I will be giving these Thursday night lectures along with the khutbah, inshallah ta'ala. And as many of you know, I'm in and out of Doha throughout the year. And alhamdulillah, I usually give the khutbah, but usually nothing other than that, just the khutbah. For the brothers, and he recommended that we do something else when I'm here as well. So this came for this Thursday night halaqah which we've taken part in uh, throughout the years many times, alhamdulillah, when the brothers were giving the explanation of Riyadh al-Saliheen, and we uh, taught that several times as well. well alhamdulillah, we're going to do this series, inshallah, when we're in Doha, and you know the groups that advertise for these halaqat, uh, all the advertisements, and we're going to be doing it, will be in those groups, inshallah ta'ala. So we have this week now, and next week, and then after that, we'll make the announcement when I'll be back, inshallah ta'ala. So tonight, we're going to have our first sitting with the first Sahabi, and we're going to sit tonight with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. And we sit with the Sahaba. What is the objective? What do we hope to gain by sitting with the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We say a sitting with them. We're sitting with them tonight. We're looking into their biography, into their seerah. What is the objective that we hope to gain from sitting with the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We have to have a reason. We come for these sittings. We come to sit down. We come to get barakah. We come to get ajr. We come to get reward. We come to learn. As the brother said, we come to motivate ourselves. But when we look into the Sahaba, who were the Sahaba? They were the best people to walk the face of this earth after the, companion, after the prophets themselves. After our beloved prophet and all the prophets that came before him, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum are the best of the creation. They are the ones who sat with and heard directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were the ones who were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Qur'an was revealed, when the wahi, the revelation, came down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're the ones who understood the Qur'an perfectly. They're the ones who understood the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam correctly. They're the ones that saw the implementation of the Qur'an and of the sunnah directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they are the ones who truly implemented Islam. Therefore, if we're going to be true Muslims, as we always say, we have to adhere, we have to follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the way of the Sahaba. We have to follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah on the understanding of the Sahaba. Therefore, when we sit with the Sahaba and we go into their biographies, and this word as sitting with them, Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was asked, you know, don't you get bored, you're just sitting around by yourself all the time between your books. And he said, how can I get bored when I'm sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba? He's going back to their seerah. So it's as if he's sitting there with them on the battlefield. He's sitting there as they're sitting in the majlis of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and taking that knowledge from them. So this is what we hope to obtain or some of it inshallah ta'ala from these sittings with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he was the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was well known for what? Each Sahabi, and he, all of them maybe have certain similarities, certain similar characteristics, but you'll find each one of them has something special, something he was known for. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, what was he known for? For the Quran and for the tafsir and his understanding of the Quran, and generally speaking, for his knowledge. He was one of the greatest scholars of Islam as we were mentioned, inshallah ta'ala, during this lecture tonight. He was born three years before the hijrah, before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina. And at the time of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was about 13 years old. Some narrations say about 15, but about 13 years old at the time of the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He migrated to Medina with his father, Al-Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before the Fath, before the conquering of Mecca. And they met with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the place known as Al-Juhfa. And 
they attended the battles, the Fath of Mecca, the conquering of Mecca, and Hunayn, uh, and at Taif during the eighth year of the Hijrah. And after that, they went with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to al Medina. So he stayed and lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for only about 30 months. About 30 months, he was with his cousin, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. And subhanAllah, this teaches us a very valuable lesson. And that it's not always about the quantity of time you spend in doing something. It's about the quality of time that you spend. The quality of time you spend doing something. So here is the greatest scholar of Islam when it comes to the tafsir of the Quran. And yet, he only spent 30 months with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The most one to ever narrate hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Who was it? Abu Huraira radiallahu an. And yet he migrated to Medina after the seventh year of the, uh, after the hijrah. I mean, towards the end also of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He spent about four, four, a little bit more years with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa About four years. And yet he gathered all of this information. It was about the quality of the time, not necessarily the quantity. He spent proper time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he strove for the knowledge. And that's why they reached what they reached, radiallahu anhum. We're going to see in this sitting that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he made two major decisions in his life. One of them that changed him and another one that changed the world. And the first decision he made at the age of 10 and the second decision he made at the age of 13. And here you see the power of the shabab, of the youth and the ability they have when they want to do something. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma at the age of 10 he made a decision that he wanted to be like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He looked at his cousin, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he decided, this is my role model. This is who I want to be like. This is who I want to imitate. So much so that he came to stay with his khala, with his aunt, Maymuna radiallahu anha, Umm al Mu'mineen the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to spend the night with her wife so he could watch and imitate what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did in his household. He pretended that he was sleeping until he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam get up and pray and he got up to pray next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so he could be like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we look at the children nowadays, we always... That was then, this was now. Look at the kids today. And we always talk negatively about the kids. But in reality, the negativity that we see from the kids today or from the youngsters, is it all their fault? Is it all their fault? Let's be honest, Yaquan. When you look at what are the kids doing, they're going with the flow in the society. They're following the norm and what society is teaching them. And then, do they have any role models to look up to? Any positive role models that we have, Muslim role models, subhanAllah, even sports-wise. Just recently, we see that some Muslim athletes have become famous and we have become, become somewhat role models to our youth, alhamdulillah. Yani, uh, our brother Muhammad Salah, for example, and some other football players that all of us know, mashallah, who are devoted to their religion at the same time. It's an inspiration to the youth. It's an inspiration to the youth. And however, it's, it's sad that and he just, throughout all the years, the Muslims who have been into this football and playing football, but they're never very good at it, subhanAllah. But now, alhamdulillah, at least we have some of our brothers who have become good. And we see now some of them in martial arts and what have you. We've seen that they have become somewhat of a role model, alhamdulillah, to uh, our youth. But generally speaking, there's not really more role models for them to follow. So we can't put all the blame on the youth for their shortcomings today. A lot comes back to us as well. His physical description, radiallahu an. Masruq ibn al-Ajda, rahimahullah, he said that whenever I saw Ibn Abbas, I would say he was the most handsome of men. And whenever he spoke, I would say he was the most eloquent of men. He spoke with elegance. And he said whenever he held a conversation, I would say he was the most knowledgeable of men. And this shows us how an individual should be, how a Muslim should be. Yani if you're handsome, Allah has blessed you with being handsome, alhamdulillah. But at least... 
we try to look represented, we try to look good as Muslims. That's how we should be. We speak properly as Muslims. You see how the Sahab, even when we, next week, inshallah, we're going to sit with Aisha radiallahu anha, and she's known for the fasaha, for the eloquence as well in her speech. This is how they were. It was something praiseworthy. And when someone speaks properly and good, this is how it should be looked at in society. It's something to look, look up upon. And you see the knowledge of that individual. And this is how the Muslim should be. When you sit with him, say, subhanAllah, this person has knowledge. This person has thaqafah, he has culture when you sit with him. And the affairs of the deen, and also the affairs of the dunya, subhanAllah. Even when we mention next week in Aisha radiallahu anha, you're going to be surprised that one of the knowledges she had, she's well known for the knowledge of Islam. But she had other knowledges as well. We're going to share that next week when we sit with her, radiallahu anha. Abu Raja, rahimahullah, he mentioned from the physical characteristics of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, is that you could see under his eyes the traces in his skin of the tears that would come down from his eyes. And it would leave the, the signs of the, of the tears constantly coming down until it left marks on his face. And many of the Sahaba had this description. Where did this come from? From the khashiyah, the fear, and the hope that filled their hearts from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء That the ones who fear Allah from His servants, truly fear Allah from His servants, are the ulama, the ones who have the knowledge of Islam. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, like the other sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they reach this high level of knowledge, what happens with the knowledge? Your iman increases. And when your iman increases, your yaqeen, your certainty increases. And that's when you reach the level of a khashiyah, the true fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when it really impacts your heart. And that's why when you read the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you break down into tears. The greatest of the sahaba, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, a siddiq, he was known for what? For constantly crying when he would read the Quran. He couldn't stop crying if he read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of the knowledge he had of the understanding of the Quran and because of the level of iman that he had reached radiallahu an. When you look into the characteristics of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he was very known to be strong in his adherence to the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to warn about bid'ah, about innovation into the religion. He was very known for his hatred towards everything that was haram. One of his students, Imam Tawus, he said that I never saw anyone that has more hatred towards that which is haram in his heart than Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. This is the way of the believer. When we see something that is haram, we see something that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's something that we have to hate in our heart, something we have to dislike. This is from Iman. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, man ra minkum munkiran, whoever from you sees the munkir, the evil, the bad deeds, you see that which is evil, what should you do as a Muslim? There's three things. It's in the hadith. In Sahih Muslim. يُغَيِّرُهُ بِيَدِهِ He changes it with his hand. If you, can, if you have the ability, it's in your household, or you're someone who's responsible, you have authority, wherever it might be, you change it with your own hand because it's haram. This is the highest level that you should be as a Muslim. The second is what? With your speech. With your speech that you remind other people. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a khutbah each time. It could be one or two words. He was also known for being, for his high intelligence and his strong memory, radiallahu anhu. And he was also known for being very persuasive and being able to convince others. And we're going to mention a story that shows you how strong and how persuasive he was, radiallahu anhu. At the age of 13, he made a decision that not only changed him, but it changed the world. At the age of 13, at the time of the death of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made a decision. He said to one of his friends, a young man from the Ansar, who was the same age as Ibn Abbas, he said to him, let's go and benefit and take the knowledge from the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while they're still plentiful. There's still many of them around. Let's go and take their knowledge before they're gone. So, his colleague or his friend said to him, who needs you now? Nobody, they're there. Nobody needs us now. They'll need us in the future, but they're not going to need us now. So why focus on this now? We'll focus on the, in the future when we need it. So he didn't focus on seeking knowledge. But Ibn Abbas, anhuma, 
he focused from that age on becoming a scholar. He decided at the age of 13 that he was going to be a scholar of Islam, that he was going to serve Islam through the knowledge. He had something very special that the Prophet Sallallahu made dua for him. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would grant him the understanding of the ta'wil, meaning the tafsir of the Qur'an, and he would grant him the fiqh of the deen, the understanding of the deen. But he didn't just rely on that. Many of us, if we had a dua like that from the Prophet Sallallahu we'd kick back, you know, and think that the, the knowledge is going to come down and it's going to open up. But he understood that even though he has this dua, if he really wants to benefit from it, he has to strive and he has to work hard. So he set an example, a role model for all of us. When he would go to the doors, the houses of the companions of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum during the days of the extreme heat. And obviously we live here in the desert. So we know what it means at Dhuhr time, the extreme heat. And like this in Medina, it's also very hot. He went and he would sit at the doorsteps of the Sahaba waiting for them to come out for Salat al-Asr, knowing that all of the Sahaba would go out and pray in the masjid. He didn't want to disturb them. He could have knocked on the door. Who is it? Tell him Ibn Abbas is here. And they would have, even if they were asleep, they would have woke up to come and to meet and to respect and to even serve the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would leave their household and they find him sitting on the door and he would describe it. He said the heat would be so severe sometimes. And as you know, the sandstorms come he would have to cover himself up from the extreme heat. He would cover himself up from the extreme heat. And then they would come out and find him sitting on the doorstep. And they said, the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu from the Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. He said, if you had called for me, if you had sent for me, I would have come to you. Allahu Akbar. If you had just sent for me, I would have come to you in your house. He said, this is not how we've been ordered. He said, you have to come to the knowledge. The knowledge doesn't come to you. You come to the knowledge. The knowledge doesn't come to you. And subhanAllah, nowadays, knowledge comes to us on our phones, in our households. It comes to us, and we skip it, and we go to something else. We have opportunities here in Doha, where many of the du'at and the scholars, they come in and out, and they visit. And how many people will take the time? They say, it's traffic, you know. It's too much traffic to go and listen. I'd, I'd like to go listen. Huh? But they don't come and they don't benefit. SubhanAllah. During the extreme heat, he's, he's covering himself up, radiallahu anh, in order to what? To go and to gain the knowledge of the companions. Many years later, when he became who he became, the great scholar of Islam, even in his early 20s, it was known who he was and his knowledge. His friend from the Ansar said, that young man understood better than us. His understanding was better than us because his understanding was strategic. He looked to the future. He said, now's my opportunity. Now I'm going to take advantage of it. And this is how the Muslim needs to be at all times. When opportunity presents itself, we take it. As it says, when opportunity comes, there's no time to prepare. You have to prepare yourself to take it when the opportunity comes. Seize the opportunity. There, the Sahaba, they're in front of me. Let's learn. But if you don't take advantage of the opportunities in front of you, you're going to be from those Later said, yeah, Laytani, I wish I had, I wish I had. He also taught us what it means to strive to be a student of knowledge. That you have to work hard, you have to go through difficulties if you want to gain knowledge. And he taught us of the adab, the respect you need to have with your teachers and your scholars. Even though he had a very high status, the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He could have went and knocked on the door. He could have sent one of his servants Say, go call, show him, I'd like him to come so I can learn from him. And they would have came out of respect for him, out of respect for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he taught us a lesson of what it means to be a student and to have respect for your teacher. During the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, the status of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma and his knowledge came clear to everyone. And that was because and pay attention, how long was the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu an? About 10 years, right? Meaning, during this time, what was the age of Abdullah ibn Abbas? 15 to what? To 25. 15 to 25. And he, so this story happened somewhere between the age of 15 to 25. He used to bring 
Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, as a young man, he would bring him inside of his majlis, his private sitting, and the other people who would sit with him, they say, were a Sheikh Badr. It's in Sahih al-Bukhari. A Sheikh Badr, meaning the scholars of uh, the, 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 the elders from Badr, meaning the elders from Badr, the one who were the older Sahaba, who had attended the Battle of Badr. And subhanAllah, they were surprised that this young man came into, uh, the, he was the only young man invited in. Everybody else was from the elders, and here's this young man coming in, perhaps a teenager or in his early 20s, and he's being invited in to the majlis of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa, Umar al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. So one of them asked one day, and they were curious, nothing against Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma. Of course, all of them loved him, but they said, why is he the special, why, why is he the only youngster who's coming in? All of us have sons, so why is he the only one who's invited into the majlis, into this gathering, and no one else is invited? So Umar radiallahu an wanted to teach them why. And sometimes the best way to teach someone something is how? Not by, by saying it, but, but showing them. Tatbiq amali, implementation in front of you. When you see it in front of you, that's when I say, ah, now I understand. He said that he called all of these ashaykh, all of these elders from Badr who used to attend and invited them. And he invited Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. And then as it was the custom of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he would love to focus on the tafsir of the kalam, of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his, in his gatherings. And this is the way that we should be as Muslims. It's something that we should revive when we come together. If we invite a brother over for dinner, say, Alhamdulillah, we don't have much knowledge, but we have the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. I have my copy in English, Alhamdulillah, I can't read Arabic. No excuse, Alhamdulillah, it's translated. It's translated into Urdu if you, if, if you know Urdu. Whatever, it is, whatever your language is, Alhamdulillah, it's there. We open up the tafsir, we read something from the surah of the Quran, a small surah, we read some ayat, and we reflect on this meaning with our brothers as we come together. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful sunnah that we need to revive, reflecting on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he had them come in, and he mentioned one of the smallest surahs in the Quran, Surah Al-Nasr, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَاتِحِ And he asked the Sahaba, what do you say about the tafsir? So some of them said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us in the end, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا In the end where he was saying this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if we are victorious, that we should praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and show his greatness, be thankful. Some of them said, لا ندر, we don't know. He looked over to the young man who didn't say anything, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. He said, is this your understanding? Is this what you understand from these ayat, the same as they said? He said, no, this is not the meaning. He said, what is it then? He said, Allah is telling the Prophet والسلام, about the fact that the end of his life is near. The end of his life is near. So if you see the Fath, meaning the conqueror of Mecca, then start to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Start to focus more on your ibadah. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ to make the tasbih, to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to thank him, and to make his istighfar to Allah because your end is near. Subhanallah. Umar radiallahu an, he said, this is the, what I understand as well. This is what I understand from the verses as well. And this showed to everyone the status and the knowledge of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. When we look into his stances, the stances of Abdullah ibn Abbas, he's well known for the stance he had against the Khawarij those who rebelled against Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. And when they looked for someone from the Sahaba to go and to remind them, to advise them, the objective of advising them is what? To get them to come back to the Haqq. They chose no one other than Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. And they sent him to these Khawarij to talk to them. And he sat with 4,000 of them. And 2,000 of them made tawbah and left their war against Ali ibn Abi Talib and joined forces with the Muslimin, alhamdulillah. They left this ideology and they went, came back to the haqq. 2,000 out of 4,000 made tawbah. How about that, subhanAllah? Sometimes we come and we talk about the haqq and we speak about it and no one becomes Muslim. We have a, thousands of non-Muslims who attend a lecture of ours, or one or two 
says the shahada in the end, subhanAllah. But you see the impact of his knowledge. Even they mentioned one time at the time of Hajj that he gave the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah in one narration of Surah Al-Nur. And they said that if the foreigners from the Romans and others, if they heard this tafsir, all of them would have entered into Islam. That's how the impact was from the knowledge that he had, radiyallahu anhuma. When you look into his knowledge, he was known by several nicknames. From them was Al-Bahar, the sea. And some was Al-Hibr, like the doctor. And the Hibr meaning because of his vast knowledge of, of Islam and the, and the Bahar, the sea, the sea of knowledge, because of all he had gathered from the knowledge of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the fiqh of the deen. He became the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba along with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud when it comes to the tafsir of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always, when, who is the most knowledgeable in tafsir? We always go back to the, the statements of Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhum. They were the most knowledgeable when it came to the knowledge of tafsir of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His knowledge of fiqh, when you go back to the books of fiqh, the big books which mention the narrations from the Sahaba, they say Ibn Abbas said this, Ibn Abbas said this, to mention his quotes in fiqh. When it comes to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was one of the seven who were the most famous narrators of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though he's at a very young age, he took some of it directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the rest from the Sahaba. And he became one of the main narrators of hadith. Whenever he was asked about knowledge, he would always answer with the Quran or with the Sunnah. He would give the ayah or mention the hadith, taking the people back to the delete. When he was asked, radiallahu anhuma, how did you gain this knowledge? How did you gain such vast knowledge? He said, bilisanin su'ul wa qalbin uqul. He said, with a tongue that constantly asked and a heart that understood. And he asking constantly, going to the Sahaba as we saw in the story. And this is how you gain knowledge. The one who truly wants to gain, they constantly ask. And we'll see this next week. When we sit with Aisha radiallahu anha, how she would constantly ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She had the opportunity in front of her and she took advantage of it. So constantly asking to understand knowledge, not being shy when it comes to the knowledge. That's how you obtain knowledge. And then having sound understanding. And the way you have sound understanding is when you, you base your understanding on that of the Quran and the Sunnah. And when you have strong memorization and strong focus, and the best way to do that is staying away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stay away from sins. When your heart is pure and your mind is pure and your understanding is based on the Quran and Sunnah, you're going to find that you, you're going to gain in your, more and more in your knowledge and you're going to have more and more in your understanding of the knowledge. When you look into the majlis, the gatherings, the sittings of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he was known to focus on teaching tafsir and teaching the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching the tafsir and the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Atta, one of his students, he said, I never saw any majlis, any gathering that was more noble than the gatherings of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. And he said in, 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 in the respect, in the atmosphere that was in it, he, he was describing the majlis. And he said, subhanAllah, he said, the people of the Quran would come and ask him about the tafsir of the Quran. And those who focus on the Arabic language, they would come and ask him about the Arabic language. And those who focused on poetry, they would ask him about poetry, and all of them would find the answer with Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. One of his main students, Mujahid, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, عَرَضْتَ الْقُرْآنَ عَلِ ibn Abbas ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ That he read the entire Qur'an, the tafsir of the Qur'an, to Ibn Abbas three times, stopping him at each ayah to explain to him. Obviously the ayah that he didn't understand. Not word for word. I mean, the one, when he would read through him, he said, what does this mean? What does this mean? And he took the entire tafsir of the Quran from Ibn Abbas three times he read to him. When you look into his students, some of the main scholars of tafsir, when you go back to the books of tafsir, and focus on this, when you go back to your copy, when you, you're at home, inshallah ta'ala, and we revive this sunnah of reading in the tafsir in our houses, our, our, our copy of Ibn Kathir, Remember these names and how many times you're going to see them in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir and the scholars of tafsir. The likes of Ikrima, Mujahid, Tawus, Sa'id ibn Jubair, Wa Atta ibn Abi Rabah. These great scholars from the Tabi'een 
were from the students of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. See the pure knowledge when you take and you, and you give it and others take it and how it spreads. This is the true barakah, the true blessings. When you have those blessed students who benefit from you and then they take it on to others. When we look into the quotes of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, one time he saw people had beautified the Quran, I mean the cover of the Quran with different, you know, it could have been some jewels on it or something like that, made it look very beautiful, the cover. And he said, do you tempt the theft when the beauty is inside? Meaning you're distracting the people with how beautiful the cover is, but the true beauty is what is inside, inside of the Quran. And that's what we need to focus on. Sometimes we focus on the beauty of the masjid, but do we focus on what really goes inside the masjid? Many of us around the world, people come and they build the masjid, but they don't focus on building the masjid, the one, the one who uses the masjid, subhanAllah. He mentioned that praying two rakats, contemplating on the meanings, is better than praying the whole night in prayer without focusing on the meanings. Just to pray two rakats with tadabbur, focusing on what you're saying in the salat, focusing on the ayat of the Quran. He said it's better than reading the entire Quran in the night, or, or, or staying the whole night in prayer, reading the Quran and, and not focusing on what you're saying. He mentioned, radiallahu an, that if you want to make the day of judgment easier upon yourself, then you should stand and prostrate before your Lord during the darkness of the night. Uh, that you should stand before your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala during the darkness of the night. If you want to make it easier for you, the standing that you're going to stand in front of Allah yawm al-qiyamah, then you stand in prayer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the darkness of the night. And we know from who he took, who he took this from, from the one he saw at what age? At the age of 10, when he said, I want to be like Rasulullah sallallahu and he saw how he would stand up and pray the long hours of the night. And he understood that this was the way to success. This was the way to Jannah. This is the honor of the believer, as the Prophet ﷺ told us. If you want true success, you have to be from those who get up and pray at night. When it came to following the ather, and the ather, the word al ather, you hear it a lot from the Salaf, from the early generations of the Muslim. And that means the guidance of the Sunnah that the Salaf, the early generations of Muslim passed down through narrations. The narrations, whether it be from the Hadith or from the Sahaba, uh, quotes of the Sahaba or even what came after that from the Tabi'een as well. But obviously here, he's referring to what came and he obviously from the Hadith and from that of the Sahaba. He said, it's upon you to be upright and follow the Athar and be aware from innovating in the religion. And focus on the meaning of this quote when he said, it's upon us to be upright, to be steadfast, to be practicing our religion and to follow the ather, to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ in the way of the Sahaba, and stay away from innovating in the religion. Because as we know, that every form of, of innovation, of bid'ah, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, is what? It's dalala. It's a form of estrayness, and every dalala, every form of estrayness like this, it leads to the hellfire. May Allah safeguard us. And he told us, والسلام, all of it is mardu, it's rudd, it's all going to be rejected. It won't be accepted from you. And that's why you'll find that his companions and those who came after them from the great imams, they constantly warned about the dangers of innovating in the religion and constantly called to adhering and following the way of the salaf of the early generations of the Muslims. When we look into the legacy that he left behind, radiallahu an, he became known as the main scholar of Islam when it came to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one of the main scholars when it came to the fiqh and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also from his offspring came who? from the Abbasi khulafa or caliphs the Abbasi empire actually was from his offspring from his grandchildren were the ones who established this uh, later on in history rahimahum uh, Allah so we'll finish now and we'll say Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh Muhammad.